Um, I did my undergrads um, in York in pure mathematics, I guess, and I moved on to um, University of Wales um, to do a master's with um, Ronnie Brown in low dimensional topology and then did a PhD in essentially categorical logic, inverse semigroup theory, that sort of thing with Mark Lawson. Um, and I've been sort of drifting around to different academic departments since then, I suppose. Um, so that's a sort of brief history of me. Um, and I'd just like to say thanks very much for the invitation to come and give a talk. It's, it's a real privilege and a real pleasure. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Go. OK, so um, as the title says, I'm going to talk about an operatic approach to card shuffling. Now, um, starting point is quite simply, we want to model shuffling decks of cards. Now, when you say that you want to model shuffling decks of cards to mathematicians, there's a sort of polite silence and a pause, and um, eventually someone makes a comment along the lines of, haven't people already been doing that for a little while? Well, yes, they have. So just to be clear about what is going to be different this time is, first of all, our decks of cards are going to be countably infinite. Secondly, our shuffles, they're going to be hierarchical. So we're going to take the result of one shuffle and shuffle it again with other decks of cards that may themselves have resulted from further shuffles of further decks of cards. And finally, what I hope is going to be different again is going to be the interpretations. Okay, well, the rules, um, how do we shuffle decks of cards? It's quite simple, just in the finite case, we've got two simple rules. So ordering has got to be preserved. If card A is above card B before the shuffle, it's still above B afterwards. The shuffle is fair, so nothing gets discarded, nothing gets introduced. And this is where the infinite case differs very slightly from the finite case, in that all cards have to make it into the shuffled deck. So if we could be shuffling two infinite decks of cards, and at some point we start placing cards from one deck, but not the other, and continue that way indefinitely, that is not permitted. That also does not qualify as a valid shuffle of decks of cards. So what we're going to be looking at, they're simple, um, and the functions I'm going to be looking at throughout this are going to remain simple. So functions defined by shuffles, something like card n of deck i gets mapped to position k in the final deck. And we want to look at the algebra of combining our shuffles hierarchically. So we merge deck a and deck b using shuffle one, but deck B actually comes from another shuffle from decks X and Y. And finally, we want to know, well, I say how to cheat more prosaically, what rearrangement of our final deck, what bijection on the natural numbers will transform the result of one shuffle into the result of a different shuffle. Okay, so let's start to axiomatize this. Um, we're going to look at the groupoids of countably infinite sets um, and our arrows, they're simply going to be bijections between countably infinite sets. And this groupoid is going to have a tensor. This is going to simply going to be disjoint union. And we're going to assume that this is strict. So a k-folds disjoint union of x0 to xk minus 1. We're going to tag these simply with the natural numbers 0 all the way up to k minus 1. And first of all, this isn't a monoidal tensor. It's not a monoidal tensor for a fairly simple reason in that there's no unit object. Now, we could put a unit object here, we could artificially adjoin a unit, but the whole point is we don't need to. Um, we don't have to, we don't need to, it wouldn't fit in with the rest. So what I am looking at here is something that aims to be descriptive. I want to describe things rather than try and force them into some preconceived assumption. So there's no unit, um, and if we wanted to maximize this, we would look at Joachim Koch's elementary remarks on units in monoidal categories, and similarly, Joyal and Koch coherence of weak units. It's a semi monoidal tensor satisfying all the usual McLean Kelly axioms apart from the existence of the unit object. And for our purposes at least, these are interesting things, um, particularly for people who are into Saavedra's theory of units, but for our purposes, um, the main takeaway is there's no surprises. Associativity, coherence, all that kind of thing, it works pretty much as you would expect it to do so. Okay, well, Let's bring a bit of order to this, and we're going to look at a semi-monoidal subcategory um, of monotone bijections on countably infinite posets. So our objects, they're going to be countably infinite posets, as the name suggests, arrows, monotone bijections, 
And again, we're going to have a tensor um, and we need to specify what the partial ordering is going to be on the disjoint union of two post sets. And of course, it's going to be the, the usual induced partial order. We can compare A and compare B if they're in the same component, essentially. And well, this is now no longer a groupoid. The inverse of a monotone bijection is not necessarily monotone, but it does give us a reasonable axiomatization for what we mean by a shuffle of k sets of infinitely many cards, which is an arrow from the k-fold disjoint union of the natural numbers to the natural numbers. And simply, monotonicity means that our orderings are preserved, and bijectivity means that all cards end up being placed at one point or another. Okay, now there is of course an alternative way to describe um, how we shuffle cards, which is a sequence, we shuffle k cards by a sequence of um, natural numbers 0 to k minus 1. The intuition behind this is that we take from depth p0, then p1, then p2, etc, etc. And we can recover this description by looking at inverses. So we take our description of a sh shuffle as a bijection, we take its inverse and we project onto the second component, which gives us what we call the sequence of planes for this shuffle. Um, and this, of course, is a point of Cantor space over the set 0 to k minus 1, but quite importantly, not all Cantor points define a valid shuffle. And that's because of the point that I mentioned earlier, that we could at one point start placing cards from one depth and forget about the other depth entirely. So not all Cantor points define a valid shuffle, but we derive Cantor points from valid shuffles of depths of infinite cards. And, well, um, I think it's quite easy to see where we're going from here when we want to interpret hierarchical shuffles. We're simply going to model the operation of using the result of one shuffle as the input to another shuffle within the endomorphism monoid of the natural numbers. Um, sorry, one moment. Um, something on the chat? Okay. No, 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 not 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 okay. no, no, no. I'll, I'll carry on. Okay, so um, we're going to model this using the endomorphism operat of the natural numbers in this category of monotone um, bijections on Cantor infinite process um, with disjoint with um, semi-monoidal tensor given by disjoint union. Okay, now at this point, um, I'm well aware that many people here know very much more about operads than I do. Um, at the same time, um, in the interest of not leaving anybody behind and because um, it's going to be recorded, um, I need to give a basic definition. So a non-symmetric operad, we're going to work in the non-symmetric case, so no action of the symmetric group. Uh, we've got disjoint index sets of operations, unary, binary, so we think of these as enemy operations in general. And we can compose these um, if we've got F in HA and G in HB. There are A distinct compositions, as in A distinct ways of plugging um, G into F, giving us an operation whose arity is, is A plus B minus one. And it's one of those things where the intuition is a lot clearer than a sort of formal description. So let's say we've got a set X. We've got a binary operation and a ternary operation. Our distinct compositions are, well, we use the result of the binary operation as the first or the second or the third entry in the ternary operation. And of course, we're going to draw this in tree form. And this is all going to give a new operation, rarity four. Okay, so very simple intuition. Um, and again, very simple axioms to go along with it. So first of all, we have an identity, which acts pretty much as you'd expect an identity to act. Um, composition is associative. So just to be clear, this, the associativity is the plugging together of these operations. We're not claiming that the operations themselves are associative. In general, they're not going to be. For us, they're not going to be. What it means is that if we take F composed with G and plug something into one of the leaves of that, it's the same as taking the corresponding plugging into leaves beforehand and then plugging that into F. And as you can imagine, there's all sorts of re-indexing that has to be done in order to make sense of this fully. Power, parallel composites, well, if we plug something into two distinct leaves, it doesn't really matter the order in which we do this. And in common with many people who give talk on operads, I've borrowed diagrams for this from Ty Dene Bradley's math 
3MA blob. Um, thank you very much. And if we want a formal definition, well, here it is, complete with all the associated re-indexings. Um, and I'm fairly sure I've got them right here. But I, if I wanted to make absolutely sure I, I've got them right, I'd go back to drawing trees. And essentially, throughout this talk, whenever possible, I'm going to draw trees rather than talk about operations and indexing and that kind of thing. So, okay. so Peter, um, Hello. You, you, so you don't want any sorry, nullary uh, operations. I mean, you're just like you said, you've got no unit in your monoidal category. Your, your notion of operad does not include nullary operations. Oh, yes. Sorry. Yes. I should, I should have made that clear. Yes. So we're starting with, with identity. Sorry, my operation. camera is on the wrong place. Uh, there we go. Okay, well, I've just explained opera ads to a number of people who know much more about them than me, so I shall carry on. Um, just to emphasize, wherever possible, we're going to work graphically. So we're going to use a tree like this to represent the result of shuffling a deck of cards with another deck of cards using the shuffle side. Um, and this deck of cards results from using shuffle five, where the second of these is a deck of cards, and the first of these arises from shuffling three decks of cards. So Simple intuition, um, simple graphical notation, somewhat complex re-indexing when we try and write things out fully. Okay, but I'm not going to talk about arbitrary shuffles. Um, I've done that in the past. Um, you end up um, going quite deep into Cantor space. I just want to talk about a certain special class of shuffles. So these are the perfect ripple shuffles. So here's a rather nice picture of what appears to be someone achieving what is essentially the holy grail of card shuffling, because if you do a perfect little shuffle, cards come ultimately from deck zero and deck one in order. Deck zero, deck one, deck zero, deck one, folding together. And then if you shuffle together two decks of cards like this and then deal them out again, well, if you deal them out between two players, you end up with one of the, one of the original decks, the other player ends up with the other of the decks. And looking as a sequence of plays, well, this is simply the alternating counter point 0, 1, 0, 1. Or if you wanted to describe this as a bijection, it's quite simply n i matched to 2n plus i, where n is an arbitrary natural number and i is in the indexing set 0, 1. And well, why, why stop with two decks of cards? Under no circumstances are we going to do just two decks. We're going to define the arbitrary k deck little shuffle to be the bijection from k copies of the natural numbers to one copy of the natural numbers. Um, that is um, essentially the natural generalization of our little shuffle. Um, cards come in order from decks zero to k minus one, start at the beginning, and come from zero to k minus one again. And we're going to take the natural diagrammatics for this, and indeed um, the function is about as simple as it gets, ni maps to kn plus i. And then we're going to look at our operad of hierarchical little shuffles to be the sub operad of the um, operad I was talking about earlier of monotone bijections. We're simply going to look at those that are generated by omega 1, omega 2, omega 3. And we've only got one generator of each arity, so we're going to draw these as unlabeled planar trees. Our identities are going to be left implicit, um, so we're not going to distinguish between these two trees here. I'm assuming everyone can see my mouse pointer. And here's the claim. The claim is that this operad is freely generated by these generators. So no two distinct k-leaf trees are going to determine the same bijection from k copies of the natural numbers to one copy of the natural numbers. OK, well, first of all, let's have a look. Um, the arithmetic here is simple. So what bijections do they determine? Well, here's an example. Um, if we fix um, our index i, what we get in every case is a linear map, n maps to xi n plus yi. And as it's a bijection, we've got the interesting phenomenon that their images are all disjoint, but the union of these is actually the natural numbers. So if you like, you can think of this as covering the entirety of the natural numbers with disjoint linear sequences. OK, now, um, if we're just sort of given some tree, how do we work out these coefficients? What's x, i and y, i are? Well, what we do is we count as though we're computer scientists. So at the top, uh, we've got a k 
out of the phosphate of BK, where we start counting zero all the way up on the left, all the way up to BK minus one on the right. And just going through the sums, um, our injection is simply N maps to XN plus Y, where X is the product of the number of vanishings at each step. And Y, it's even simpler, we can just write down the value of this. And we write down the value of this, well, by using um, a mixed radix counting system. So um, the idea behind this is that, well, instead of counting in decimal or binary or hexadecimal or whatever, um, it's a positional number system, but the base used varies between columns. So you see this, I mean, historically, these things have been as common as um, our standard counting system. We have um, days of the week, months of the year, hours, seconds. Uh, we've got four farthings in a penny, 12 pennies in a shilling, 20 shillings in a pound. But all we can do is write down the value of y in this form. So we've got an ordered factorization of x, and we write down the value of y simply by writing down the vanishing we take at each stage. And if you're not happy working with the mixed radix system and you want to transform it into base 10, well, there's plenty of work on the transformations of determined by changes of radix in computer science, particularly with regard to fast Fourier transforms. Okay, well, that's the elementary sums anyway, and they, they really are elementary. So let's go on to this Freenus business. So how can we prove that this OPLAB is freely generated by, by these generators? Well, the messy way of doing it is tedious direct calculation. The slightly smarter way of doing it is by induction on the number of leaves on the tree. And once you do it by induction, it's practically trivial. There's only one almost non-trivial part, and we need to show at each stage that no generator can be written as a composite of any other generators. And we do this by observing that our generators are actually a very special form of shuffle. Um, so, um, we're going to say a shuffle of k-decks of cards is standard when it's monotone in both variables. So what this means is, is that at any stage in this shuffle, the number of cards placed in deck i is at least as large as the number of cards placed in deck i plus one. Alternatively, if you look at a tree and take a natural number on a leaf traversal, well, you get an ascending sequence. Alternatively, we can write these things out as though they are Young tableau, admittedly infinitely Young tableau. Um, we have 0 to k minus 1 down the sides, we have the natural numbers across the top, and we have the results of our bijections fitting ourselves. Um, now, a standard one, this is going to be standard in the center young tableau, so it's going to be ordered vertically, and it's going to be ordered horizontally as well. And another way of looking at this is the sequence of plays, when we write that down, is going to be an infinity ballot sequence. So um, in any prefix, the number of zeros is going to be at least as large as the number of ones, which is at least as large as the number of twos, and so on. Okay, now, Can we characterise our standard shuffles? Well, certainly our generator set of standards, um, that's instant. So when is a composite standard? Well, for a composite to be standard, we need two conditions. Composite S composed with T is standard, when S and T are themselves both standard, and when the product is actually the overproduct, where the tree grafting takes place on the far right leaf. And this is, of course, the overproduct, um, it's an associative operation on any operad. And as an illustrative example of why this is the case, let's ask ourselves what happens when we say plug omega 2 onto omega 4. And all that's happening is we're taking our infinitary young tableau and we're taking row 2 and splitting it up. So we're splitting it up into two distinct rows, or more generally, the composite, um, the jth composite with T splits the jth row of a young tableau into K rows. Um, according to the shape of T. We could do this with um, finite young tableau, but then you have to consider partial actions, all that kind of thing. So it's much simpler in the infinite case. So this overproduct is standard because we're grafting onto the far right leaf here. And more generally, the standard shuffles are precisely the form of overproducts of sequences of generators. And from, the, and from here, it's really rather trivial that no generator can be a composite, a non-trivial composite of this form. 
our generating set is minimal, therefore our induction works, and therefore we deduce that this is indeed um, freely generated um, and isomorphic to the operadic basic rooted planar trees. Now, um, here, I think I've got time. Um, I'll take a brief digression. Um, it's fun, so maths should be fun. Let's take the digression, even though it's not really that much to do with the rest of the talk. So, um, our definition of operads doesn't allow for an infinitary composition, which is a shame because in this case, we can actually give a meaning to that kind of thing. So at the moment, we've got our operads of hierarchical ripple shuffles. We've got an injective monoid homomorphism from the three monoids over the natural numbers to this, um, simply by taking every natural number and mapping it to omega n plus two. So um, omega one um, is the identity, um, and omega zero we haven't defined. So the question is, can we extend this to one-sided infinite strings, as in points of the Cantor space over the natural numbers in the same manner? Can we assign a meaning to an arbitrary overproduct as a shuffle of countably many infinite decks of cards? Well, yes we can. All we have to do is prove some notion of convergence and as a kind of heuristic argument for why we can we have convergence, let's consider some arbitrary infinite sequence of overproducts. Um, and then we look at the sequence of tableau determined by the finite prefixes. We choose a natural number, doesn't matter which one, and at any stage um, when we move from a prefix to the next prefix, a natural number is either not going to move at all, or it's going to move leftwards and possibly downwards as well. Now, if it doesn't move at all, it's stuck in place. It's not in the final row. Or alternatively, it's the first entry of the final row. In either case, it's not going to move at all as we go down this sequence of prefixes. So we have a notion of convergence. We can give a meaning to an infinite over, over products of generators in this setting. We can formalise this if necessary, but for me, the heuristic argument works well enough to explain how these things do indeed converge. But let's not forget, um, this talk is about simple arithmetic functions, and we can um, do this with this in the simplest case. I call this the of course bijection because it was used by Jean-Yves Girard to model the of course modality in linear logic. Um, and in tree form, all that we're doing is um, we're taking two decks of cards. We're shuffling th them together with um, a ripple shuffle. And the second of these decks of cards came from shuffling together two decks of cards with a ripple shuffle. And the second of these, and so on, all the way up to infinity. And we get a bijection on the natural numbers, which is monotone in both variables. Um, we can give it a tableau explicitly and interpret things such as card two from deck four ends up in position 79. Or we could take its inverse um, and then we get a ballot sequence of plays. So we take the inverse of this, project onto the second variable um, and get a map from the natural numbers to the natural numbers, giving this sequence here, um, which is of course a ballot sequence. There's more zeros than ones, more ones than twos, more twos than threes. And here's the other reason why it should be called the, of course, bijection. So let's say we want to characterize this sequence. Um, inverting that function and projecting to the second component is kind of awkward. If I was given a sequence of decks of cards in front of me, here, 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 all the way on in the distance up to infinity, practically, how would we perform this shuffle? Is there a simple heuristic way that we could perform this shuffle? And if, if we can, well, how about we make it a bit more complicated and take an arbitrary overproduct of generators? How would we perform that shuffle? And well, this is just a sort of puzzle for anyone who is sort of feeling a bit bored with the rest of the talk. I'll give the answers at the end. Okay, well, that's the end of the digression anyway. Um, there is a role for infinitary trees, um, but no suitable actualization as yet. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to go back and look at finite trees, shuffles of finitely many decks of infinite cards, and we're going to look at Stashev's associative in these terms, and we're going to interpret the facets, so 
the vertices, the edges, the faces, etc., in a very, very concrete terms as shuffles of infinite decks of cards. So I've again borrowed diagrams from Ty Danny Bradley's rather nice blog, so I should do a bit of advertising for it if I'm going to borrow diagrams for it. Um, and moving on from here, so this brings us along to the question of how do we rearrange the result of one shuffle into that of another. So if we're given hierarchical ripple shuffles, well, we can rearrange the result of one into the other quite simply because these are simply bijections. So we take the inverse of one and apply the other instead. And we're going to define the rearrangements, the k-deck rearrangements. Um, we're going to have an inclusion order sequence of sets of bijections. So um, these are given by taking, rk is given by taking two distinct, or sorry, two ripple shuffle, two hierarchical ripple shuffles and composing one with the inverse of the other. So we're getting um, inclusion ordered um, sets um, of bijections on the natural numbers, elements of the symmetric group on M. Okay, well, we're going to use the obvious diagrammatic notation for composition for, for composites here. Um, this is um, composite of a shuffle and its inverse. And then we see that our inclusion ordering comes from a sequence of identities, which again we're going to draw diagrammatically. The identity is omega 2 composed with its inverse, omega 3 composed with its inverse, etc. And when we have um, a shuffle and its inverse, we could put any of these, split it in the middle, take the top half of this, plug it in there, take the bottom half of it, plug it in there, we would get the same thing. So we get a way of composing the k deck rearrangements into the k plus m deck rearrangements of shuffles of shuffles of cards. Okay, well, let's start writing down some basic properties. First of all, R1 and R2 are the identity on the natural numbers. Um, they're not closed under composition. Each RK is not closed under the composition of um, bijections. The composites that are contained in RK are those of the form UT inverse composed with TS inverse, which is of course going to give us US inverse. Um, it's closed under inverses and they're all going to be piecewise linear bijections on the natural numbers. And we're going to take a very simple definition here. We're going to define the set of rearrangements to be the union of all um, k deck rearrangements. Again, just a subset of the symmetric group on the natural numbers. And well, going back to point three, we see that we've got a sort of post settle kind of property here. It's a triviality that um, if we've got any three k deck shuffles of decks of cards, this diagram commutes. We rearrange the result of shuffle S to look like the result of shuffle T. We rearrange the result of shuffle T to look like the result of shuffle U. Well, unsurprisingly, this gives us the rearrangement um, of shuffle S to look like the result of shuffle U. But we can also interpret this as a functor from a post settled groupoid of trees to the symmetric group on the natural numbers. So we're going to define the post settled groupoid of rooted planar trees. Um, and there's going to be a unique arrow between any two rooted planar trees, um, provided they've got the same number of leaves. So um, obvious functor. Um, and well, the way this works is that every tree is going to be mapped to the natural numbers. And if we've got any two k-leaf trees, we, um, we interpret them as shuffles of decks of cards and projections. Um, and then the interpretation is that um, the unique arrow from S to T gets mapped to the inverse of S composed with T. It's OK, it's not complex. Um, and just to be clear, um, there, I'm not claiming any tensor or anything like that on this. This is simply a formality in terms of mapping one tree uniquely to another. But what this does let us do is um, we interpret tree rearrangements as bijections on the natural numbers. And do, by doing this, we can build commuting diagrams over the symmetric group on the natural numbers. And let's take an illustrative example again. So here's our simplest non-trivial example, K3. Um, it's usual to start at K4, but let's go with K3 in this case. We've got two vertices and one edge. Um, 
we're interpreting them all in the same way. So these are simply shuffles of decks of cards. The edge is labelled by generator. Um, the left here, well, we're little shuffling two decks of cards and little shuffling the results with another deck of cards. They're very, very simple arithmetic functions, which we write down here. And then we can say, well, how do we map between these? Well, we map between these by composing, placing one on top of the other. So alpha here um, looks like an associator, so we'll call it alpha. Um, we undo our right shuffle and compose it with our left shuffle instead. Um, I call this CZL for left. Um, we undo the result of our left shuffle and rewrite it as our generator. Um, and similarly, CZR, undo the result of our right shuffle and rewrite it as the generator omega 3. And just to emphasize, these are still very simple arithmetic functions. So alpha, well, if n is even, we multiply it by 2. If we were taking the inverse, we'd be dividing by 2 instead. It's as simple as that. Um, CZL, well, slightly more complex. Um, if n is odd, we multiply by 3, um, add 1, and then divide by 2. Um, and the point here is that read bracketing in right to left factors as the composite of something that could think of as deleting brackets and reinserting brackets. Okay, well, um, so what can we say about this? So far, we have got nothing more than a set of bijections on the natural numbers. So here's a list of things that I would like to say about this. We can say more, but um, this, these sort of conveniently lead on one to the next. So first of all, its members are homeomorphisms. It's natural to interpret our shuffles as determining open covers of the natural numbers, in which case our rearrangements become homeomorphisms. Um, so if you recall, every shuffle determines an index family of linear maps. These can be seen to cover the natural numbers with disjoint linear sequences. And we can and we should think of this topologically. Every shuffle determines a disjoint, finite open cover of the natural numbers. So the way this is done is, well, we look at the linear subsets um, and, well, the natural numbers is a linear subset. We add the empty set, at which point the Chinese remainder theorem tells us that this is closed under intersection. It therefore determines the basis for topology on the natural numbers that was first written down by Hillel Kirstenberg in 1955, when he was still an undergraduate, um, giving a non-constructive topological proof that there are infinitely many prime numbers. So our rearrangements, we need to think of them as living within the group of homeomorphisms on the natural numbers with respect to this topology. Now, first and foremost, topology is, is kind of a fun thing. Um, the basic open sets are both open and closed. So it's quite simple to take any linear sequence and write it as the complement of a union of linear sequences. A n plus b, well, we take a n plus c, where c is not equal to b, and we write it as the complement of the union of that set. The key to his proof about the prime numbers was that open sets are always infinite, and it's, it really is as simple as that. Um, and it also contains um, some interesting topologies with which we may be more familiar. So in particular, if we look at um, the basis of um, 2 to the a n plus b, um, well, there we recover something that is isomorphic as a locale to the usual Clopin topology on Cantor space. Um, the way this correspondence works is for Cantor space, well, the basic open sets, we take some member of the free monoid over 0, 1, and we put it at the start of every possible element of the Cantor set. That determines a subset of the Cantor set um, closed under intersection. And what we do is we interpret the length of this word, uh, sorry, we um, interpret this word itself as a binary number, and then we look at the corresponding basic open set to the first and both topology, which is two to the power of the length of this word plus the word itself interpreted in binary. And, well, these arise from the sub of um, our hierarchical Riffle shuffles generated by omega 2, so the pairwise perfect Riffle shuffles. Which brings us on quite neatly to our next point, which is that R contains a copy of 
Richard Thompson's group F. So um, there's two different ways of going about this. Um, there's an algebraic approach and a categorical approach. This is a category theory seminar, so I'll take the categorical approach, um, but it works equally well if you go via inverse semigroup theory. And well, the basic idea is that let's say we've got an object of a strict monoidal category and we've got an isomorphism from x tend to x to x. Well, the arrows in the endomorphism monoid of x that are generated using this isomorphism, its inverse and the tensor, um, key point of Fiori and Lenster's 2010 paper is that these form a copy of a very significant group introduced by Richard Thompson that he called F. Well, we already know we've got our binary Riffle shuffle, our pairwise Riffle shuffle. So we know that um, this set of rearrangements contains a copy of F. So the question is not, is it there? But what does it look like? What does it look like in particular as simple arithmetic functions, projections on the natural numbers? Okay, well, first of all, about this group. Um, it's one of the best known groups in mathematics. Um, Thompson introduced this in 1965 as a potential counterexample to a conjecture of von Neumann. Um, von Neumann's conjecture has since been proved to be false, but it's still unknown whether um, Thompson's group itself is a counterexample or not. So it's a great place to go when you're looking for conjectures or counterexamples to someone else's conjecture. Um, it's got close connections to, as we've seen, category theory and indeed the theory of complexity. Um, people in theoretical computer science love it for, um, for precisely that reason. Um, and it was proposed in 2004 by Vladimir Shkilrein and Alexander Ushikov as a platform for non-commutative cryptography. Um, so more on that later. But time for a definition, because I can't talk about a group and not actually tell people what it is. So we've got a countably infinite set of generators. Um, we can work with a finite set of generators, but at least if we're working with generators and relations, it makes more sense to work with a countably infinite set. And we've got a deceptively simple condition linking um, conjugation and our generators. Now, I'm not going to take the approach by generators and relations um, because we've got a particularly relevant description as pairs of binary trees with the same number of leaves. And we are, of course, going to interpret these as hierarchical little shuffles in particular that generators by omega 2. So if we were to look in Jose Barrio's book, Introduction to Thompson's Group F, we find um, notions of equivalence that allow us to account for equality and composition. So the first point is that if we've got our binary trees R, S and T, then we have this rather neat condition that we have, of course, seen earlier. Secondly, we should think of equivalence classes of trees rather than trees themselves. So um, we have, if we have a matching subtree in the right position, then we can cancel the matching subtree from the first and second trees in our pair. Well, from our viewpoints, one of these pairs is upside down. They should be connected at the ends, at which point this eliminating matching carries step, that's simply the first in the series of identities to give us our inclusions of rearrangements of shuffles. And well, it's also well known that two pairs of trees are enough to generate the whole of F. Um, so this is alpha. This is the first of the pair of trees. We're drawing these as, as mappings, of course. And the second, well, it's alpha applied to a subtree. And the question is, how are we going to describe this? OK, well, this brings us on to something that um, sort of keeps getting rediscovered, um, which is if we've got a monoid with a semi-monoidal tensor, the canonical associativity isomorphisms in every case, well, in every case except for the case where the unique object of the monoid is the unit object, in every case they call the isomorphic copy of Thompson's group F. And this is a decidedly non-comprehensive list of people who have spotted this either this or something that is very directly equivalent to it. Um, now, I suspect that the number of people who have actually spotted this is uncountably infinite, because every time I present a list, someone tells me of another name that isn't on the list. So it gets added on that I think this is probably a non-terminating process. So the question is, we've got this representation of F determined 
in a fairly natural way by um, pairwise riffle shuffles on the symmetric group of the natural numbers. Does this correspond to some tensor? And this brings us quite neatly onto our next point, which is connection to operations in linear logic. So, um, Jean-Yves Girard, um, his Geometry of Interaction series of papers, he gave a representation of various fragments in linear logic. And the relevant one for us is the model of conjunction found in his first Geometry of Interaction paper, Interpretation of System F. Um, the use of F is entirely a coincidence of notation between two different fields. And the way this works is, well, we've got bijections, um, F and G, uh, in the symmetric group on the natural numbers. We define another bijection, um, F star G. And the way this works is we take the even numbers and map them to the whole of the natural numbers and apply F, and then map them back to the even numbers. We do the same with the odd numbers. We take the odd numbers, map them to the whole of the natural numbers, then map them back to the odd numbers. And this is, well, by now it's well known, this is a semi-monoidal tensor. So, Thinking concretely, operationally, we undo the result of the riffle shuffle, we apply F to deck to zero and G to deck one, and then we redo our riffle shuffle. And we're going to draw this in a very natural way, um, and we're going to interpret bracketing as true structure, and well, it's fairly straightforward where we're going from here, and what we wrote down as alpha earlier is indeed the associator for this semi-monoidal tensor. And what this means is that we can write, we can check McLean's Pentagon condition, or rather we can sort of give it to the nearest school age child to check because these are remarkably simple arithmetic functions. We can check McLean's Pentagon condition. And the one thing we note about this is that this isn't the way we usually write Pentagon condition. Um, we haven't got any subscripts and we haven't got any subscripts because the symmetric group on the natural numbers only has one object. So we've got the one associator, um, and that's it. OK, well, about that single object. Well, the connection between the one skeletons, as in the vertices and edges of the sociohedra, is pretty well known, um, dating back to Kapranoff's classic paper in 1993. If we've got n objects of a monoidal category, the associativity isomorphisms give a commuting diagram whose shape is the one skeleton of Kn. Well, um, fortunately, he didn't say distinct objects, not that that really has much of a meaning in category theory. What's when the category theory is not only a small category, but only has one object? Well, all vertices are labelled by the same object, and edges are all labelled by the mem members of the same group, regardless of which associohedron we're considering. So, in our setting, every associohedron determines a commuting diagram of bijections on the natural numbers, and these arise from an arithmetic representation of Richard Thompson's group F. And how this is done? Well, let's take an edge between n leaf binary trees. We orient our edges. Um, it's usual to do this based on the Tamari ordering, but feel free to choose whatever ordering you like. We label the edge by the corresponding rearrangement. So we interpret T1 and T2 as shuffles, and then we label the edge by T2 composed of the inverse to T1. So the result of transforming one shuffle into the result of another shuffle. And finally, we replace every vertex by the natural numbers, giving us our commuting diagram. Okay, well, here we have to ask which elements of F end up labelling our edges. And well, just to go back to basics, there's an edge between two vertices if we can remove a pair of brackets from each to get the same edge label. Alternatively, we can map from one to the other by single rebracketing. And we see this in work by Patrick de Hornwell from 2011, um, where he introduced what he called the symmetric generating set for F. And this was characterised by pairs of trees that differ by a single rotation. Well, rotation, um, computer scientist terminology for application of associativity. So, quite unsurprisingly, um, what we get labeling the edges is members of the Hohenwald's symmetric generating set. And we can also see this as um, a categorical thing because he introduced this in terms of indexing subtrees 
by finite binary sequences. We can understand these, his generators and his sequences categorically using Girard's tensor. Um, so we can characterize his generators by saying that the associator alpha is one of them. And given any generator in his set, then identity star D or D star identity are also in his generating set. So we're looking at the closure of the associator under the functors or simply injective homomorphisms, identity star blank and blank star identity. And then we interpret his binary strings as describing repeated applications of these two injective homomorphisms on the symmetric group of the natural numbers to the associator. Okay, well, it's kind of fun. It's interesting to interpret his group theory as category theory. Um, but now I'd like to ask, how does Girard's conjunction interact with the rest of the rearrangements? Well, let's have a look. We're going to now introduce an opera of injective group homomorphisms on the symmetric group of the natural numbers. So if we think of Girard's conjunction um, or tensor um, as in terms of card shuffles, it's quite natural to think of it simply as the first of a series of maps. Um, I have a substantial typo there. That should be the symmetric group on the natural numbers, not the natural numbers. So the first of a series of maps from the k-fold product of the symmetric group of the natural numbers to the symmetric group on the natural numbers. Um, I have it more correct here. Um, so we call these generalized conjunctions simply because they're generalizing Girard's model of the conjunction. And these are injective group homomorphisms given by conjugation by the, appro the appropriate generator of our operad of hierarchical Riffle shuffles. And the intuition, well, we take a k-deck Riffle shuffle, um, a generator, we undo it, and we apply the bijections f0 to fk minus 1 to the respective decks, and then we shuffle our cards together again. And that's it. Well, each of these is, of course, injective and also a group homomorphism. And we can see this simply by considering the identities written the other way around this time, giving us the identity on two copies of the natural numbers, three copies of the natural numbers, four copies of the natural numbers, and so on. So for a convenient notation of this, we're going to write our generalized conjunctions not as functions, but simply we're going to write them using similar notation to Girard as a star. And well, again, I keep emphasizing this is about elementary simple arithmetic. We can write these out explicitly. Um, the twofold star we have already seen, the threefold, it's exactly the same thing, but we're looking at modulo classes three rather than two. And the general case, well, we can simply write down a formula for it. We're looking at um, the remainder when we divide by k. So we map a linear sequence to the whole of the natural numbers, apply the appropriate bijection, and then map it back to where it came from. And we're going to look at um, the endomorphism of the, of the symmetric group of the natural numbers in the category of groups with products. And then we're going to look at the sub operat of this generated by these generalized conjunctions. And well, because our operat of hierarchical riffle shuffles is freely generated, um, it doesn't take long to conclude that distinct bracketings of this form are going to determine distinct homomorphisms, simply because they're defined by conjugation by the appropriate elements of a riffle shuffle. And well, um, this tells us that our operat of generalized conjunctions is freely generated by a single generator of each arity. And so again, um, we're precisely looking at rooted planar trees. Um, and well, the set of rearrangements is going to be closed under these operations. Um, this is almost by definition, so we can simply write down what we actually get if we um, apply these conjunctions to our, our, to our rearrangements um, and appeal to the fact that these are group homomorphisms. So it's possibly not that surprising that set of rearrangements is closed under these 
these um, group homomorphisms. And well, again, by construction, pretty much, um, um, the rearrangements act by conjugation on these group homomorphisms to rebracket. So including adding or deleting brackets to generalized conjunctions. And going back to our um, K3, well, we have alpha acting by conjugation to map a right bracketed form to a left bracketed form. We have CZR acting on a right bracketed form to map to an unbracketed form. And CZL acting by conjugation the other way around this time to add brackets rather than remove brackets. And the associator alpha um, factors through CZR and the inverse of CZL to first delete a pair of brackets and then put back a pair of brackets somewhere else. And well, because these are acting by conjugation, we can start writing down things like this that look somewhat like naturality. Now, I'm being very careful here not to try and force things into a framework where they don't necessarily fit. Again, as I said at the beginning, what I'm trying to do here is to be descriptive not to try and build examples of something or other. I simply want to describe how rearrangements behave, how they interact with card shuffles. Okay, well, the next claim is that rebracketings are unique, which again, um, it's, it's sort of hard to know um, how, um, how this could be made complex. Um, so um, if we've got rearrangements that act by conjugation on one um, generalized conjunction, sorry, one series of generalized conjunctions to map it to another, we can simply write down which rearrangement this should be um, and deduce that these rebracketings are indeed unique. Well, okay, all fun and games. So um, all of our rebracketings, rebracketings, erasing brackets, putting brackets back, they're elementary arithmetic operations. So it's almost trivial to write down relationships between them um, axiomatize precisely the conditions that they satisfy, solve equations over them, all that kind of thing. That's not true. Um, now, if we try and go down that route, we are overreaching. And the fact that there was a serious attempt by serious cryptographers to break base protocols on Tonkin's group F should give us a pause for thought. Now, sadly, um, this um, cryptographic protocol was shown to be insecure. I say sadly because I would like nothing more than for the world's cryptography to be based on the properties of associators and commutative diagrams, but that's not the case. But it was a serious attempt, um, and it was a serious attempt by serious people taken very seriously. We need to pause for thought. And this brings us to the final point, which is we encode undecided, possibly even undecidable problems even at the simplest level. Okay, well, let's go back to McLean's pentagon. Um, again, McLean's pentagon simply over the symmetric group on the natural numbers. And let's take this and let's add in the factorization of alpha in, in terms of the deleting and adding brackets again that we saw in K3. Now, the fact that, um, the fact that um, our star is a homomorphism tells us that we can replace identity star alpha by identity star this composite. So let's add in these things and get another commuting diagram. Um, and well, if in doubt, these are the card shuffles from that are being rearranged in each case. Um, and these are again, simple arithmetic functions. So let's see them. Let's name our bijections. Well, Alpha and identity star alpha, these generate Tonkin's group F. Um, CZL inverse and CZR back to the associator. So this is what they are explicitly. And whenever we see something this simple, we really need to ask ourselves the question, where have I seen something like this before? Well, CZ is of course for colors. Um, it's not the famous 3x plus 1 problem, the one that everybody um, avoids working on simply because they know they would end up banging their head against it and making no progress and wasting a lot of time. But um, Jeffrey Ligarius, um, in his paper from 1985, the 3x plus 1 problem and its generalizations, he describes a very significant precursor to this. Um, so 
This was found in a notebook of collapse um, from 1st of July 1932, and he describes this function, calls it G, and poses the question of whether a cycle containing eight is finite or infinite. Now, he calls this the original collapse problem. It hasn't, of course, been answered, and to put things in context, well, G is simply the inverse of CZR. Um, are taking a right bracketed form of something and deleting the brackets from it. The question's the same. Um, now, I should say at this point, um, I got in touch with Ligarius and asked him various questions about this, and he very kindly answered. Um, so, um, we know that such problems can be undecidable. Um, John Conway's unpredictable iterations, encoding Turing machine halting problems into simple iterations of arithmetic functions though not quite of the form just described. Now, this problem almost vanished into obscurity. Um, Ligarius rescued it and popularised it, and he is a great source who, of, um, of all things collapse related. Now, what he did tell me was that what used to exist was a letter from collapse describing his motivation. Why was he looking at this particular function and what's special about the number eight? So collapse is, um, paper describing the motivation for the 3x plus 1 problem still exists. Um, this no longer does, unfortunately. But, well, we can turn, um, we can turn this into uh, something convenient for us and instead speculate. And by speculate, I mean fabricate, of course. So fabricate a convenient story about precisely what this function is describing. So here it is. Um, I personally find this problem actually more interesting than the 3x plus 1 problem, because we can write it in this form. So Alice and Bob are playing a game of cards against a dealer who has an infinite deck of cards. The dealer deals them out evenly, a standard way of dealing out cards. Well, because it's an infinite deck of cards, he has to take from the bottom at each stage, but we all do that from time to time. Alice and Bob merge their hands of cards together using a perfect riffle shuffle, and then pass that on to the dealer who merges it with, the, with what he has in his hand, again using a perfect little shuffle. He then holds an infinite deck of cards. The process repeats. And what makes this a sort of slightly nightmarish game is that Alice and Bob cannot leave until one card that they marked beforehand returns to its original position on the dealer's hand. So they choose the eighth card. Are they still at it? Are they at it forever? This is the original collapse problem. Um, well, they chose the eighth card, the dealer started counting at zero. He may have been cheating. But why should they choose eight as their lucky number? Well, they're, they're gamblers. They're more used to playing with 52 cards rather than Aleph Null, and their riffle shuffle is performed by cutting a deck of cards and then merging back together. And the number of steps needed to return a standard 52 deck pack of cards back to its original position is precisely eight perfect little shuffles. And speaking of things going on forever, um, I think that's pretty much me done for the moment. Um, this is, of course, sort of work in progress, fun things to play about with. So I'm going to leave it there and just sort of say the, the diversion I took. Did anybody find a convenient way of little shuffling infinitely many decks of cards? OK. Um, Okay, so let's have a look at the sequence of plays then. Um, we call this the of course bijection, um, and it's based on binary. So we're counting in binary, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. And if we number our bases 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, we don't look at the number each time, we look at which column increments. So at every stage, a column in our binary representation increments by 1, and simply listing out the columns in each case gives us um, the sequence of plays for the of course bijection. And if we were working with an arbitrary over product, we would instead work with a mixed radix counting system with our columns labelled by x0, x1, x2 for the over product of omega x1, omega x2, omega x3. And with that, um, I really am done now. So thank you very much, everybody who's still with me. Thank you very much. Let's thank our speaker. Hold on. 
Any questions? Any discussion? Can, can I ask, is it easy to say what um, Colette's motivation for the 3x plus 1 problem was? Um, I'll send you the paper. Um, <laughs> it's, <laughs> I mean, that's also something else that was almost lost. It was translated from German into Chinese and then back into German and then into English, I believe, or something like that. Um, it's, it's a slightly obscure paper. Um, and he's slightly vague about it, but um, yeah, <laughs> um, it's not it's not immediately clear even on reading the paper. I'll say it would be wonderful to see uh, you know, a shuffle type motivation for for the the Colitz problem. It certainly would. Yes, I mean the problem there, of course, is that the operator isn't um, isn't a bijection, so you have to sort of do some violence to the isosahedron in order to get to it. Um, but yes, it would be a wonderful thing to see, um, to actually sort of put it into some mathematical context rather than having it sort of floating through, so to speak. Anyways, any other questions, any discussion? Okay. Anyways, Peter, thank you for a wonderful talk. And let's thank our speaker again. And um, I think um, uh, Rick Blute is speaking next week. And uh, you're all invited to come and uh, check us out. Same bat time, same bat channel. OK, thank you very much. Hey, cheers. Take, take care. Peter, it was perfect. Okay, cheers, Marcel. Catch you later.